The lymphatic system. Lymph vessels are found in all tissues except the central nervous system, the bone marrow, and tissues without blood vessels such as cartilage. The lymph system vessels are extensive as the vessels of the circulatory system. The lymphatic system serves several functions. It controls fluid balance by draining and cleansing the fluids that leave the circulatory system to deliver nutrients and gases to the tissues. It interacts with the villi in the digestive system to absorb and deliver fats to the circulatory system. It also has an immunological protection from viruses, bacteria, fungi, and cellular debris that could damage the cells of the body. From your understanding of the circulatory system, you know that the blood passes through the arteries, arterioles, and then the capillaries. The capillary walls allow the fluid portion of the blood to exit the capillaries into the surrounding tissues. Once the fluid leaves the capillaries, it is called interstitial fluid. About 90% of this fluid will diffuse back into the capillaries because of the difference in concentrations of the fluid. However, about 10% of the fluid will enter the open-ended lymph vessels. Once the fluid has entered the lymph vessels, it's now called lymph. These vessels eventually deliver the lymph to locations where the lymph can be cleansed of debris and check for the presence of pathogenic organisms. How it gets the lymph there is pretty amazing. There is no heart for this system of vessels to pump the lymph around. So how does a lymph get to the locations it needs to be delivered to? The lymph moves through your body when you move your skeletal muscles. The contraction of skeletal muscles squeezes the nearby lymph vessels, pumping them. This pushes lymph through the vessels. In addition to the contraction of skeletal muscles, there are two other means by which lymph travels through the lymphatic system. There are smooth muscles at the larger lymph vessels. The contraction of these smooth muscles adds to the force provided by the skeletal muscles. Also, when we breathe, pressure changes occur in the thoracic region. When the thoracic pressure drops, that tends to pull lymph into the thoracic duct. One-way valves prevent the lymph from flowing backwards. The function of fluid balance is seen best, perhaps, when it goes awry. When the lymphatic system is prevented from doing its job, the fluids build up in the tissues. Edemas is the term given to this medical condition. Mild edema can occur during pregnancy when the weight of the baby slows the ability of the vessels to move the lymph up the body. More serious levels of edema can occur in a tropical disease called elephantitis in which a parasite blocks the vessels and the edema that is produced looks a lot like having legs of an elephant. Some lymph tissue is very diffuse with no clear boundaries. You can actually feel some when you rub your lower inner lip with your tongue. Others are more organized into groups and these are called lymph nodes. Lymph nodes have three functions. First, they are testing stations. They monitor the blood by receiving samples of the blood plasma. Second, if the sample is rife with foreign invaders, they produce lymphocytes and send them into the bloodstream to try to destroy those invaders. In addition, the lymph nodes filter the lymph that they have so they can only return clean fluid back to the blood. Eventually, the lymph is returned to the circulatory system via the right and the left subclavian veins in the shoulders just above the heart level. Lymph nodules can be found as single structures in the body or they can be grouped together in small clumps. That's what the tonsils are. They're groups of lymph nodules under the mucous membrane in the throat. These lymph nodules form a protective ring around the throat strategically located to protect the body from foreign invaders. If the tonsils get infected, they can become inflamed and abnormally enlarged, as you see here. This condition is called tonsillitis. If the condition is chronic, the tonsils can be removed in a tonsillectomy. Tonsils tend to get smaller as a person matures, and they can actually disappear altogether in an adult. Peyer's patches are very similar to tonsils. They are groups of lymphocytes and lymph nodules that are in the small intestines. Typically, they're found in the last third of the small intestine. Once again, they're strategically located to deal with foreign invaders. The lymphatic system's second function takes place here in the small intestine as well, the absorption of fats. We will discuss this more in depth in the topic of digestion, but for now, know that there are specialized lymph vessels called lacteals in the intestinal villi. These pick up fats that are released from digested food and absorb it into the villus tissue. The liquid in the vessels take on a milky color. Instead of being called lymph, this fluid is called chyle. The chyle eventually gets dumped in the subclavian vein, just like lymph. 
That is how the fats enter the circulatory system. The spleen is a significant lymphatic structure and has a lot in common with the smaller nodes throughout the body. But unlike the lymph nodes, the spleen does not filter lymph. It's part of the lymphatic system, however, because it filters the blood. As the blood passes through the white pulp of the spleen, foreign invaders stimulate a response from the diffuse lymphatic tissue or the lymph nodules. The spleen also works to clean the blood of worn out erythrocytes. Remember, red blood cells have a short lifespan. As a result, roughly 2 million erythrocytes die every second. They must be removed from the blood, and that's another job of the spleen. Before the blood leaves the spleen through the veins, it passes through the red pulp. Macrophages and the red pulp engage in phagocytosis to remove both foreign invaders and worn out red blood cells. The third function of the spleen is to act as a reservoir for oxygen rich blood. The spleen actually holds more blood than is necessary for its own metabolism. Therefore, it's an extra blood supply full of oxygen and nutrients. This serves as a backup supply of blood in case of blood loss. If the body detects blood loss due to hemorrhage, the sympathetic division of the ANS stimulates the smooth muscles in the capsule of the spleen to contract. This pushes the backup supply of blood into the bloodstream, compensating for the blood loss. Although the backup supply of blood in the human spleen is rather minor, it's a major factor in the physiology of some other mammals. Seals use the spleen as a built-in oxygen tank. When the seal dives, it conserves its oxygen as much as possible. However, when it's running low and cannot get to the surface, the smooth muscles of the spleen contract, sending the oxygen-rich blood stored there into the bloodstream. This gives the seal more time before it must surface to breathe. Although the spleen is part of the lymphatic system, you can live without it. If your spleen is ruptured due to an injury, it can be removed in a splenectomy. This is often necessary in order to stop internal bleeding because the spleen is so vascular. Once your spleen is removed, tissues in the liver as well as other lymphatic tissues in the body take over the first two tasks of the spleen. Of course, the overall function is not as good as when the spleen was present in the body. As a result, people who have their spleens removed are more susceptible to infections and more sensitive to hemorrhage. The spleen is roughly the size of a clenched fist. Unlike lymph nodes, however, the capsule, or outer cover of the spleen, contains smooth muscle tissue. Extensions of this capsule, called trabeculae, make up the skeleton of the node. The lymph nodes are fed by several afferent lymph vessels. However, lymph exits through just one efferent lymph vessel. Reticular fibers extend from the trabeculae, forming a net of connective tissue throughout the lymph node. Inside the spleen, there are two types of tissue, red pulp, and white pulp. The white pulp is composed of diffuse lymphatic tissue and lymph nodules, much like the lymph node. This white pulp surrounds the arteries which enter the spleen. The red pulp is made of twisted veins and reticular fibers which are full of blood cells which were in the capillaries of the spleen. Lymph nodules contain germinal centers where rapid mitosis of lymphocytes can take place in response to foreign invaders found in the lymph. Lymphocytes produced in the germinal centers are released into the lymph and eventually reach the bloodstream, where they can be transported to the tissues. Another lymphatic system structure is the thymus gland. Like the tonsils, the thymus gland changes as a person matures. When a person is young, the thymus gland is large in proportion to the body size. During this stage of life, it is mostly lymphatic tissue. After puberty, it decreases in size and becomes mostly fibrous and fatty tissue. What does the thymus gland do? Like many things in the human body, the scientific community is still rather puzzled by the thymus gland. We know that while a person is young, immature lymphocytes known as T lymphocytes leave the bone marrow, remember, blood cells are made in the bone marrow, and they travel to the thymus. The remarkable maturation process, sometimes referred to as thymic education, T lymphocytes that are beneficial to the immune system are spared, while T lymphocytes that might evoke a detrimental immunological response are eliminated. For example, if you have type A blood, T lymphocytes which attack the A antigen are destroyed. However, T lymphocytes which attack the B antigen are allowed to mature and enter the bloodstream. Notice that this one is called a gland. That means that one of its functions is to secrete hormones, making it also a part of the endocrine system as well as the lymphatic system. It produces hormones. Principal among them is the hormone thymosin. What does thymosin in the body do? 
Well, we're not really sure. We know that it affects the immunological response of the body. However, the way that it's done remains unclear. One prevalent thought is that thymosin stimulates the activity of lymphocytes to migrate to other lymphatic tissues. The systems of the body interact quite a bit. This is especially evident when discussing immunity. Many of the things that give us immunity are not part of the lymphatic system. Instead, they are part of another system and simply aid the lymphatic system in its job. Pathogens are organisms that can make us sick. Pathogens come in several forms. Bacteria can be a pathogen. These are the ones that give you sinus infections, infected cuts, meningitis, etc. But not all bacteria are pathogenic. We couldn't live without some of them. There are also pathogenic fungi. Most of the pathogenic fungi are single-celled organisms called yeast. Pathogenic yeast can cause athlete's foot, thrush on the tongue, vaginal yeast infections, and so on. There are parasites as well, such as pinworms, roundworms, tapeworms. There are viruses. A virus is a bit of DNA or RNA that's wrapped in its own protein coat. Since it has none of its own cellular machinery, it invades other cells and hijacks the cell's machinery to make proteins and copies of itself. In the end, the cell gets so filled with these copies that the cell ruptures. Then those copies end up going on to infect new cells and the whole process keeps rolling. There are cancers. Now these are actually our own cells that have been damaged. They can't control their functions any longer, so what happens is they end up, instead of dying like they're supposed to when they get worn out, they undergo uncontrolled mitosis, continuing to make copies of themselves. This makes a tumor that keeps growing and growing until surrounding tissue is crowded out and becomes damaged. That's usually the point where most people realize they have the cancer. Other things that can happen with cancer is that the cancerous cells can break loose of the main tumor and spread in other places of the body, setting up tumor growth in those locations. Though not an organism, there are also toxins. These are also harmful to the body and the immune system has to deal with those as well. The first line of defense is our non-specific immunity system. What that means is that the defense is not targeted against a specific invader. Instead, it's an innate defense against a variety of pathogens. We'll take a look at skin, mucus, urine, stomach acid, tears, and symbiotic organisms. The systems in this section act as the first line of defense and either keeps pathogens out, as in the case of skin, or they try to trap or kill pathogens before they get very far in the body, as in the case with mucus and gastric juice. The vast majority of pathogens do get stopped at this first line of defense. The skin is part of the integumentary system. The keratin in skin cells make skin waterproof, and it allows the skin to act as a barrier, keeping foreign invaders out of the body. Sweat washes the surface of the skin. It also helps lower the pH of the skin. Those low pH environments inhibit the growth and activity of many pathogens. The sebaceous glands secrete oil, which contains antibacterial substances. Some epithelial tissues, such as that found in the sinuses, trachea, and cervix, secrete mucus. This mucus traps and catches microorganisms so that they cannot go anywhere. Once the pathogens are trapped in the mucus, the body needs to get rid of them. That is accomplished by cilia on certain cells that line the mucus producing epithelium. These cells beat their cilia, moving mucus toward the mouth or nose. We can then blow our nose, cough, or swallow the mucus so as to get rid of it. The cervical mucus is a nonspecific defense against infection. But in addition, cervical mucus contains antibodies, which are part of the acquired immune system. Thus, cervical mucus is a mixture of nonspecific and specific defense. Urine is also a very important first line of nonspecific immunity. Any opening to the outside is a potential place for infection. Urine washes out the track that leads to the outside. It helps fight off any organisms attempting to enter the body that way. The acid in the gastric juice kills most pathogens. Thus, swallowing our own mucus helps us kill pathogens that are stuck in the mucus. If we eat food that contains bacteria, as most food does, the gastric juice in our stomach kills those bacteria before they can do any damage. Tears contain an enzyme called lysozyme. This enzyme breaks down the cell walls of many bacteria. The term lice means to break. 
So lysosome is an enzyme that breaks cell walls. Lysozyme is the main reason that we rarely get eye infections. The tears bathe the eye in lysozyme, killing bacteria which try to infect it. However, sometimes even the lysozyme in tears is not enough to kill the bacteria invading the eyes. When that happens, the eye gets infected. The most common bacterial infection of the eye is known as pink eye. There is one more first line of innate immunity, symbiotic organisms. There are a host of symbiotic organisms which live throughout the body. Bacteria in our intestines, for example, produce vitamin K, and in return we provide food and a place for them to live. Those symbiotic bacteria flourish in our intestines, and their population can actually squeeze out populations of pathogenic bacteria and fungi which might get past the stomach. In addition, symbiotic bacteria and fungi that live on our skin and consume our sweat produce lactic acid, which fights off both pathogenic bacteria and fungi. Now we are to our second line of defense, the immune system. There are two big divisions in the immune system, innate immunity and acquired immunity. Innate immunity is a nonspecific immune response because it's the same regardless of the pathogen or toxin encountered. You have this as soon as you're born. You cannot get distemper, for instance, because you have an innate immunity to this disease common to dogs. Acquired immunity is an immunity response targeted at a specific pathogen or toxin. When we catch and then recover from a certain disease, we might become immune to that specific disease. However, that immunity will not help us fight off another disease. For instance, chickenpox immunity won't help you against the measles. The immunity we acquire once we get chickenpox is specific only to the chickenpox virus. The immune tactics we'll now take a look at target a specific type of invader. It could be a whole group, such as bacteria or viruses, or be very specific to a particular pathogen, such as the chickenpox virus. Interferon is a protein produced by a cell infected by a virus. There's really no hope for a cell once the virus enters the lytic pathway. However, as it's being attacked by the virus, the cell will produce interferon. The interferon won't save that cell, but it will affect neighbor cells as they're being signaled to strengthen themselves against viral attack. Complements are involved in fighting foreign cells, which are generally bacteria. The complement system is made up of 20 plasma proteins made by the liver, which is then released into the bloodstream. Like blood coagulation factors, these proteins stay inactive in the blood serum until something activates them. The foreign invader itself can activate the protein or the presence of antibodies bound to antigens can do the activation. Either way, this happens only when foreign cells are present. They can lyse bacteria. The complement proteins combine to form a hole in the plasma membrane of the foreign cells, particularly bacteria. This causes its components to leak out, killing the foreign cell. Not only can the complement proteins lyse bacteria, but they can also attract phagocytotic cells. The phagocytotic cells can then destroy the bacteria by eating them. These proteins can help promote inflammation. You might think inflammation is bad, but it can be a very good thing. Inflammation is a sign that there's a war going on between your body's defenses and an invader. The signal can rally the troops, bringing more disease-fighting mechanisms to bear. When the body cells are under attack, they send out chemical signals that are picked up by the basophils, which are attracted to those signals. The basophils in turn release a variety of chemicals, leukotriene, prostaglandin, heparin, and histamine. Heparin inhibits blood clotting, allowing the wound to wash out any foreign matter that may have been introduced during the injury. Histamine triggers inflammation or vasodilation. Vasodilation is when the vessels dilate, making them larger. This brings in additional blood flow to the area so that the area has additional resources for fighting any infection. In addition, the dilation makes it easier for white blood cells to squeeze between the vessel cells in order to enter into the tissue that's damaged and infected. This process is called diapedesis. If the infection stays contained to the one location, it's called a local inflammation. But if that infection escapes into the bloodstream and spreads throughout the body, it triggers a systemic inflammation. There are many types of white blood cells that will become active in fighting an infection. The basophil is merely the first type. We'll learn more about the other types in a moment. 
Any bacterium or a virus can potentially be attacked by white blood cells, so they're nonspecific. White blood cells generally have about a 12-hour lifespan, and they're produced in the bone marrow. The neutrophils and monocytes are phagocytes. That means they can eat other cells. Neutrophils are typically the first of the two phagocytotic white cells to respond. They are not very large, and they can only consume about 20 bacteria before they reach the end of their lifespan. They can consume fungi and some viruses as well. They hang out in the liver, spleen, and lungs until needed. The next to respond are the monocytes. These are the larger phagocytotic white blood cells, the big eaters. Once they enter the tissues, they are called macrophages. These big boys can consume about 100 bacteria in their lifespan. They also tackle the really large pathogens, such as parasites. These white blood cells will hang out in the tissues, near vessel walls, and around the lymphatic vessels. Eosinophils are also part of our innate immune response. These cells reduce inflammation. Why would the body have one type of cell that promotes inflammation and another type that reduces it? Well, inflammation can be a good thing, but too much inflammation can be very bad. Thus, inflammation must stay under control. Eosinophils contain enzymes that tend to break down inflammatory agents, keeping inflammation under control. Pyrogens are chemicals which promote fever by acting on the hypothalamus. Sometimes your own white blood cells will release pyrogens in order to help develop a fever. These pyrogens travel through the body and affect the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls body temperature. Chemical reaction rates increase with increasing temperature. A fever speeds up the immune system. The mitosis of the white blood cells go faster, increasing the white blood cell population. Also, a higher temperature is often not good for the invading microorganisms. Bacteria especially like cooler temperatures. Humoral immunity is an immunity which comes from antibodies in the blood plasma. Since humoral immunity comes from the actions of antibodies, we should concentrate first on what antibodies are. First of all, antibodies are proteins. Basically, antibodies are made of four polypeptide chains, two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains. These chains are arranged in a Y shape. The parts that you see in red are variable regions. These designate what the invader will fight. They are antigen binding sites that allow them to grab onto invaders. It's sort of like a key fitting into a lock. The parts in blue and yellow are constant regions. They will determine how the antibody will fight. Each antibody class fights in a different way. One, they could bind directly to the antigen. This would be the job of immunoglobulin D. They can bind the antigens together, and that would be immunoglobulin A. They can activate complement, that would be the job of immunoglobin M, but scientists have found that immunoglobulin G can do this as well. They can stimulate phagocytosis, this would be immunoglobulin G's job, and they can stimulate inflammation, and that would be immunoglobulin E. We need to point out one more thing about the production of antibodies. Remember that a person cannot produce antibodies against antigens which he or she has in their own cells. For example, if you have type A blood, you cannot produce the antibody against the A antigen. However, if you are suddenly exposed to type B blood, you will immediately start producing antibodies against the type B antigen. Thus, your lymphatic system knows your blood type and knows how to spot an erythrocyte from another blood type. How does the lymphatic system know your blood cells from other blood cells? Well, there are about 20 specific glycoproteins which exist on the cell membrane of every cell in your body. This collection of proteins is called the Major Histocompatibility Complex, or MHC for short. The structure of these proteins is determined by 20 genes in your DNA, each of which has more than 50 alleles. Thus, there are literally billions of combinations of these alleles and each combination produces a unique MHC. As a result, it's virtually impossible for two people to have identical MHCs unless they're identical twins. The MHC, then, is a fingerprint for your cells. Any cell that has your MHC will not be attacked by your lymphatic system because the cell has the correct fingerprint. Antibodies are produced by B cells, which are specialized lymphocytes. Like all blood cells, these lymphocytes are formed from the stem cells in the bone marrow. They are formed with antigen-binding sites on their plasma membranes. 
when exposed for the first time to the antigen for which they are specific, these sites bind to the antigen, and the B cells begin to proliferate. The proliferation produces two types of B cells. The plasma B cells release their antibodies into the plasma so that the antibodies can attack the antigen to which they can bind. After the infection, most B cells die, but the memory B cells are long-lived B cells which do not release their antibodies. Instead, they circulate in the body waiting for the next attack by the antigen. This allows the body to respond quickly to any subsequent infection by the same antigen. Memory B cells are the means by which vaccinations provide immunity to certain pathogens. There are two basic types of vaccines. The first type contains a weakened form of the pathogen itself. Since a pathogen is weakened, your body's immune system will destroy it before it can overtake your body. Thus, even though the vaccine actually contains a disease-causing pathogen, the vaccine is safe because the pathogen is so weak that your immune system will destroy it. The other type of vaccine contains a synthetic chemical that makes the body react the same as if a certain pathogen has entered the body. This type of vaccine then mimics a real pathogen, causing the immune system to react and produce antibodies as well as memory B cells. Even though memory B cells are long-lived, they don't last forever. Thus, some vaccines require a booster to boost the memory of the infection. When the body is first exposed to a pathogen, the B cells will produce a primary response. This response fights the infection and produces memory B cells. The memory B cells will then produce secondary responses if the pathogen infects the body again. Cell-mediated immunity is an immunity which comes from the actions of T lymphocytes. T cells deal primarily with cells found in the body, such as cancerous cells or cells harboring viruses. T lymphocytes respond to the chemicals released by the macrophages. T cells originate in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus gland, and the T and the T cells stand for thymus. T cells, like B cells, have antigen receptors. However, these receptors are not associated with antibodies. Instead, they simply allow the T cells to recognize molecules which are on the plasma membranes of other cells. This helps the T cells distinguish between cells which belong to the body and cells which do not. When a cell has been invaded, it often produces MHC proteins that are not part of the fingerprint of the body cells. This then makes the cells look foreign to the T cells and the T cells react. Even cancerous cells usually produce aberrant MHC proteins, which once again causes the T cells to react. They divide and specialize into different types. Cytotic T cells puncture any cell in the body that are infected with viruses or are cancerous. Helper T cells connect to the macrophages via a major histocompatibility complex and greatly increase the rate of cell division of all lymphocytes, helping the defense system cope with more pathogens. The well-publicized disease known as AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus HIV. This virus destroys helper T cells. As the population of helper T cells in the infected person diminishes, pathogens which would normally not be able to get through the immune system are able to take hold, because B cells and cytototic T cells production is limited. Cytotic, or killer T cells, and helper T cells are classified as effector T cells. Memory T cells store the chemical compositions of pathogens and the attacks against them. Suppressor T cells shut down the immune system in case the attack is against the body itself, an autoimmune response, or when the immune response is over. Another type of effector T cell is the delayed hypersensitivity T cell. This kind of T cell responds to antigens by releasing chemicals which promote inflammation. They also promote phagocytosis by attracting macrophages through chemotaxis. These cells are particularly active in allergic reactions. Ooh, for example, the itching and burning sensation caused by poison ivy is a delayed hypersensitive T cell response to antigens produced by skin cells which interact with poison ivy. There are four basic ways that acquired immunity can be stimulated in the body. The first and most obvious is active natural immunity. This is the acquired immunity which comes from being exposed to a pathogen. For example, when you are first exposed to the chickenpox virus, you get sick. Your body must fight off the virus. However, after that, 
you don't get sick from the chickenpox virus again because your body has the memory B cells or T cells which will produce a quick and effective response for any secondary responses that are needed. You can also receive acquired immunity artificially which is referred to as active artificial immunity. This is the immunity that you receive from vaccines. The vaccine causes your immune system to react forming memory B cells or T cells and this in turn gives you acquired immunity to that disease but the immunity is artificially induced. Passive natural immunity occurs between the mother and the baby. Immunoglobin G is an antibody that can travel across the placenta during pregnancy, providing the baby with the same immunity which the mother has. In addition, immunoglobin G antibodies are found in breast milk. Thus the baby receives immunity from diseases to which the mother is immune by breastfeeding. The final means by which immunity can occur is passive artificial immunity. In this situation, a different individual is exposed to a pathogen and thus creates antibodies. Those antibodies are then removed from the individual and transferred to someone else. This provides immunity to the pathogen. Although this procedure is often done using another human, sometimes an animal, such as a horse, can be injected and then the horse's antibodies can be transferred to the person who needs the immunity. This is only a temporary fix, however, since the antibodies will be removed from the person who receives them in a relatively short period of time. Examples of this procedure include treatments to fight rabies and tetanus in people who are not vaccinated against the disease but are exposed to them. One type of immunity which is not good is autoimmunity. In autoimmunity, the body cannot differentiate between the MHC of its own cells and that of others. Thus, it starts attacking its own cells. Multiple sclerosis, for example, is an autoimmune disease. The lymphatic system cannot distinguish between neuroglia of the body and foreign neuroglia. As a result, the lymphatic system begins attacking the myelian sheaths of the nerves. This causes a loss of control of the skeletal muscles and a loss of sensation. The body's defenses are designed much like that of a well-built fortress. The blood is regularly checked and cleaned by both the lymph vessels and lymph nodes, as well as the spleen. In addition, the body has two lines of innate defense against pathogen, each of which has several different components. Finally, the body has an incredible means of acquiring immunity to specific diseases and remembering that immunity so the pathogen can never successfully cause another infection. Finally, each cell in the body produces an elaborate display of proteins which tell the body whether or not the cell is native to the body or a foreign cell which must be destroyed. Indeed, this world is a dangerous place in which to live, but the body's designer has given us all that we need to stay well protected.